Hello, welcome to another lecture for English 1060 Online. Today what we're going to do is interview methods. And what we want to look at is just a way to form your questions, you know, to make sure you kind of think about how to ask questions like a pro. And again, you think, you know, you have normal conversations every day, questions should be easy. Uh, however, when you're in the formal interview setting, you want to really think about, you know, the approach to making good questions so you could get great answers. The problem, as I think I mentioned on the previous lecture, you will be interviewing family and friends. And so they might not really uh, take the assignment seriously in a way because they might be kind of joking around with you. And so you definitely want to make sure you have good, serious questions that get them thinking, that get them actually answering, you know, what you need to gather for the assignment. So let's look at types of interviews, just a in general. I always like to start with basic fundamentals first. So besides face-to-face -face interviews, many reporters and researchers use a variety of techniques to gain an interview. This is where technology is great. You know, email, you know, it's a popular medium since you don't have to arrange a specific time. You could also, again, have the email trail. So you could easily, again, copy and paste the transcripts, right? Even though it's very long, you know, this email is great because you could always have follow-up questions and need for clarifications, you know, for, you know, immediately. Phone or Skype is always good, too, you know, uh, which helps any kind of immediate follow-up questions you may have. Or, you know, prevent misunderstandings because you could communicate immediately. And if there's something you, as the interviewer, doesn't understand, you know. Uh, yeah, Ashley, got a question? Actually, you know, that um, some programs exist. If you don't have the app, for example, to record a phone call, with Skype, uh, you could use kind of what I do for class and use the screencast. Um, and it's free. And basically, you, you will be recording everything that's happening on your computer screen. So everything that's in the Skype square, you are actually recording. So a uh, screencast is a good way to record any kind of Skype conversation. And it's just, and I'll just type it out just so uh, you see it. But it's just called Screencast, and it's technically, if you look it up, it's I think Screencast O Matic. But if you type in Screencast, you know that that you there are many different po programs. A lot of them are free. A lot of them you have to pay for. But Screencast is the free one. You have about 15 minutes, but you can always you know pause and upload the recording and record again. So you know, it, Screencast is great. Um, phone again. Sometimes apps exist. Other times, you know, you have to be careful. Uh, if you don't have the app, you know, for example. And so uh, you just kind of want to make sure. Uh, yeah, if you do, you have the app. Yeah. But yeah, that's a good question. Uh, or, you know, again, if you're just phone, just use, uh, you know, handwrite <laughs> their answers down, which, of course, you see how that, cumber that can be very cumbersome. Surveys uh, are, of course, a popular type when dealing with large numbers. So, you know, if you want to do a survey, you really kind of have to do a questionnaire for this assignment because we're not interested, or at least I shouldn't say we, I'm not interested in large group. I want you to really focus on a small group of people. So, again, four, right, four to six, really. And so surveys would be helpful if we're looking at large research, but we want to really focus on a small, intimate group. And so if you're going to do a survey, which you could, you want to really make it a questionnaire and to have, you know, very open-ended questions as we'll look at in a moment. So the finished product, obviously, may be a piece of writing that you craft, but this is the most difficult with interview-based papers. The material itself is a result of the interviews you conduct, so you have to rely on other people, and so that can be troublesome, right? So the stronger the questions and the more prepared you are, you know, before the interview, typically the better responses you will obtain. The four most important characteristics of any interviewer are, of course, you know, sincerity, curiosity and having an open mind, listening skills, and, of course, well-prepared questions. The bad interviewer, though, only asks the questions he or she brought. You always want to go off script, and that's where the curiosity and listening skills come in. If you have a person that's really talking very profoundly or very detailed, you know, you definitely want to ask immediate questions. You don't just want to go back to your script. In terms of listening skills, one technique you do is you repeat the last word that they said. So let's say we have a conversation, right? So I, I, let's say I ask, okay, what's your favorite football team? And you say, the Chicago Bears. And I go, oh, the Bears? When did you start liking them? And you said, oh, well, you, my grandfather always liked them, so I was a fan since I was a kid. Oh, since you were a kid. So did you go to any games? 
Uh, no, I never actually got to a game. You didn't go to any games? Why not? And so what you do there, what am I doing there, is just kind of repeating their f end phrases or their end words. And it mimics, you know, um, the, and sometimes uh, <laughs> almost too well, it kind of mimics the fact that you are a good listener. And so a lot of people will respond very well to that. And so if you kind of use their last words to spark other questions, a lot of people will give you uh, better responses because they really feel like you're listening. If you ever need dating advice, too, that's another way on a first date, right? You just kind of use uh, that method and the person really feels like you're paying attention. So what you want to do, too, is set the stage. So you don't want to just think about your composure and the questions. You always want to think about stage. And this is very important, again, since you're interviewing friends and family oftentimes. The atmosphere may affect their behavior. And so, for example, you don't want to ask questions in the dorm room, or you don't want to ask questions in their bedroom, or you don't want to ask questions at the kitchen table. What you want to do is find a little bit more formal setting, whether it's even just a coffee shop or some sort of, you know, library, you know, some place that will make the subject feel comfortable, of course, but also has a, a good feel to it, too, right? Something that's a little bit more professional, because you'd be surprised, I mean, or actually, you probably wouldn't be surprised. People will, you know, kind of adjust to the location. You also want to prepare your goals ahead, and this is going to be very important once we get into essay three and essay four. A good essay really starts with a, an essay question, not a thesis. You know, you, so what am I trying to do? What am I trying to prove? Instead of saying, you know, like, I will prove that gay marriage should be legal. You know, you want to think about why should gay marriage be legal first, right, before you actually compose the essay. So you want to think about your goals. What questions are you going to ask? And then, of course, most importantly, why are you going to ask them? Why are you asking these questions? What do you hope to gain, you know, with this essay? Or what do you hope, you, what do you hope to accomplish with the essay? And same things, bring prepared questions, write your questions down, put them in your cell phone, you know. The usual trick, and this is true for photography as well, if I'm on a photo shoot, I'm going to take 200 photos, right, and I'll probably only use one. No, you don't want to be that extreme with questions, but you want to bring at least twice as many questions as you even expect to ask. Because you might get a very shy person, you might get someone who's, well, especially if it's your friends, you know, they might be like, well, you know, you know my experience, or you, I've talked about this before. And so you want to get them to open up and talk more specifically. And so you definitely want to have a lot of questions to get them moving. You also want to think about balance. You want to think about cohesion, just like you would for an essay. So you want to work on flow. So you want to strike a balance between a conversation, which helps, again, make you, you know, or I mean, that should be your, uh, makes your subject feel more comfortable. And then, of course, you know, getting the job done. The flow of questions needs to seem natural, and that's what's important, right? And controlled, without awkwardly jumping from topic to topic. Because people don't really respond well to that. When you jump from different topic to different topic, right? So, you know, if you said something like, you know, were you popular in high school? And then your next question was something like, you know, did you study well? You know, it's just that's not a great flow. You want to kind of move, you know, talk about academics first, then extracurricular, then kind of personality questions, you know. So you want to get, you know, a good co sense of cohesion. Another, and this is very important because some of us can deal with this very well, endure the awkward silence. You know, let the interviewee struggle with an answer. Don't, because they're going to prod, prod you to try to kind of make you answer for them. And so give them time to formulate the response. Don't coax them because a lot of people want that, right? And so novice interviewers will coax answers from the subjects when they need to let the speaker answer the question for him or herself. And so, and again, that's it, uh, the awkward silence is going to make your interviewee talk. And a lot of times it's going to make them talk even more profoundly than they would if they just answered the question immediately. And again, don't be afraid to go off script. Ask those follow-up questions. If they say something really important, don't just, you know, follow your script. If the subject offers an important insight, well, explore it further rather than sticking to your written questions. Always bring in recording devices, too, you know, so, so, and test your equipment, right? So if you're not just going to hand write, because hand write's fine, too, but, again, it's always important to use the kind of double strategies of kind of writing a few notes or, or if you have a tablet, you know, record, but still, you know, type a few notes or something like that. And But, of course, any time you do, test your equipment. Make sure the microphone's working. Make sure you could adequately hear yourself and, you know, your interview subject. And so, again, just be prepared, you know, think ahead, and, and that's, you know, always true for any kind of life situation. Now, the question uh, of the question formula is very important. The purpose of any question is to discover the interviewee's knowledge, opinion, and then feeling, right, about a particular topic. 
So the best type of questions are always open-ended and usually begin with, of course, the classic five W's and an H, right? Yes or no questions can help, but of course immediately follow up with a who, a what, a where, a when, a why, you know, uh, and or how, you know, how so or something like that. Because, you know, you need, again, you need to prompt thought. And you've ju if you just keep on asking yes or no questions, they will respond very simplistically. They will not, even if they just don't say yes or no, they'll just say yes, I did, or things like that. They're not really going to give you a full-fledged answer. Uh, oftentimes, though, especially in situations like our essay where you're having the subject talk about himself or herself, the subject typically likes talking about their history, especially if you've, you've, you know someone who really had a great high school experience. Let's say it was popular or, you know, the, you know, the kind of archetypal, you know, uh, football star or something like that. And so let them talk about themselves. And so really use these kind of open-ended questions. Now, what do I mean by that? An open-ended question is designed to encourage a full, meaningful answer using the subject's own knowledge or feelings. It is the opposite, of course, a closed-ended question, which encourages a short, single-word answer. Open-ended questions also tend to be more objective and less leading than closed-ended questions. Open-ended questions typically begin with words such as how, why, or phrases, and it doesn't have to be even a question. It could be almost like a command. Tell me about this, or describe for me your high school experience, right? And so sometimes when you give them a command, they give you a better response, too. Often they are not technically a question, as I just gave with those two examples, but a statement which, of course, implicitly asks for a response. And so, you know, describe for me your high school experience, tell me about your days being a football star, you know, all sorts of things, and people will respond very great. And so, you know, it, it's important to kind of look at that. So let's just look at the differences between closed-ended and open-ended. So, for example, if I just said, do you like English 1060, right? Well, you could just say yes or no. If I said something like, are you voting, right? Well, yes, you know, there's not really a very complex answer there. What should the name of UNCP's mascot be, right? Uh, again, notice how it's a what question, but it's still basically a one-worded answer. So we still have a close-ended question. That's why typically, you know, again, those open-ended questions are really going to be why or how, right? What and where could be simply a one-word answer. Same thing like that. Who makes the best pizza? Well, you could just say Pizza Hut or Papa John's or what have you, right? And so closed-ended questions, again, don't really get you to a point where you're getting really good responses. So here's what you want to ask instead. How is English 1060? Right? What are you looking for in a candidate? Who should be able to rename the mascot and why? What ingredients make the best pizza, right? Now you have a discussion, right? And so this is what's important. And so you just want to, s and again, it's just about controlling your language, which is, of course, always a concern for us writers. So you just want to give us, you know, questions that will lead us to a really good, you know, open-ended discussion. You also have to be careful of another form of kind of closed questioning is leading questions. For example, if I were to say, you hate this English class, don't you, right? You know, what am I al already kind of putting you into at the spot of suggesting that you hate this, right? And so you don't want to do leading questions, right? E and again, even though you know people and you'll probably say, like, Mom, you know, let's say, for example, you really loved your, Engl uh, your, your history, or excuse me, your high school, right? And so, you know, you don't just want to lead, have leading questions. You want to really open it up. Even a question like this, are you voting Republican or Democrat? Well, what if you're not voting? What if you're voting independent, right? And so you have to be careful of leading questions. Now, people use leading questions in order to, you know, kind of control the facts. But, you know, we're not politicians, and so we don't want to use these type of techniques. Uh, for example, this, right, because this was a controversy a couple years ago at this school. Is Brave Hawk a less controversial name than Tommy Hawk, which Tommy Hawk was the original name of the mascot. And, of course, again, it already implies that Tommy Hawk is more, con you know, controversial. Same thing, what kind of pizza do you like? What am I implying? That you like pizza. And so you want to just be careful about these leading questions. A leading question subtly prompts the respondent to answer in a very particular way. Or it puts the interviewer, excuse me, it puts the interviewee in the kind of 
almost defensive mode. So instead of just answering something very objectively and very just kind of calmly, you know, you hate this? Well, no, I don't hate this. And now you kind of feel like you have to explain yourself and you're on a defensive. And so, you know, leading questions aren't really helpful, even if they're just positive questions, like are you voting Republican or Democrat? There's no real kind of, you know, treachery behind that. But there is an assumption that you are only going to vote one way or another. And so you really want to be careful because leading questions...